So we were using Skinny, an ROV you guys are familiar with, and then aptly named Fatty behind it uh, was this <laughs> device that had an acoustic system that looked at, at, at stuff below it. We'd drill a hole in the ice, we'd put the ROV and Fatty down the hole, and we'd fly them around um, and, and do these transects. Uh, my job uh, at first was to design this, before we left, was to design this Fatty package um, that all these components would fit in. Um, and then also when we were in Antarctica supporting the launches, I was piloting the ROV, um, and then finally when things went wrong, it was my job to lose cares about that. So, uh, what Antarctica is really like, I, I didn't know what it would be like, I had only seen movies, and in my mind, I pictured like, God, this is going to be so awesome, There's, we're going to see like penguins jumping out of the water, and they're going to interact with us, and we're going to be like, we're going to be like looking at, you know, these big glaciers, and you know, taking tours to look at that, you know, there's going to be explosions, and <laughs> we're going to be riding in helicopters. That, that was what my vision of Antarctica was before going. Um, and I'm here to tell you uh, that it is exactly like that. It was so cool. Uh, so, um, I mean, there were penguins jumping out of the water. That you could just, I mean, watch them. They'd, they'd come and, like, hang out with us. Uh, it, like... I mean, we'd just be working, and there they'd be, um, you know, <laughs> chilling. Uh, I, I love the delis, by the way. They were really great. Um, what else? Uh, well, let's see. Um, there, there was one thing. We, we got to go on some amazing tours. I have to say, thank Stacy for making that happen. We got to so go see glaciers. I mean, this, it was just extraordinary. I mean, the things we got to see, we, we you know, be able to witness stuff that hardly anyone on the planet has been able to see. It was Truly remarkable. There were whales. Like, that's cool. Okay, that's, that's even cooler. Wait, wait, wait. That's like the coolest. <laughs> it got so good. And not just killer whales. There were, I mean, up close encounters with other ones. I mean, the whole thing was amazing. I mean, you'd think it couldn't get any better. And then it was like, oh my god, there's explosions. <laughs> the whole thing just blew me away. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then, of course, most awesome James Bond-like thing I had been picturing forever. There were helicopters. I just loved helicopters. And I got this shot. I mean, it's just, you can't get more James Bond. Like, this was a really hard shot to get because of Clint Collins. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we try to, like, photobomb me taking a <laughs> <laughs> Every single time. I mean, like, it, 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 it wasn't just that time. Like, here's a cool one, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> other people would go, you know, I tried taking photos. <laughs> other people would get it. This is, you know what I mean? She's tackling me, so I can't get footage of that helicopter. And then, that's Stacy also photobombing the image. <laughs> they wouldn't let me get away with it, but I did get that one clip, so wow. every single thing. That looked like someone else is getting tackled. I remember Stacy saying, well, I was asking how big the ROV has to be, and she wrote me this email back, well, you know, in order to fit in the helicopter and the piston bowl, here, I'll send you dimensions. And this is before we left, and I got this email, it was just like, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? This is, it was just the coolest thing, I remember that feeling. Um, so, I mean, to summarize that, I'd say of the top 10 things I've ever done in my life, like some of the best days of my life um, happened during that trip. It was, it was something that truly changed my perspective on the world, the perspective on what technology can do, um, and my perspective of how people are, how you can really get to know a team. It was life changing. Um, so I wanna give you guys an idea of, of what it's like getting there, how you know how the process works. I think that's sometimes overlooked. First, you fly to Los Angeles, then you fly to Auckland, and then you fly to Christchurch, um, and then uh, you are issued this ECW, extreme cold weather gear. You kind of learn how to put that on. You go into this terminal. Um, it's operated by the the Air Force. You get on a bus. You get on a C-17. Um, you fly on the C-17 for like six hours, something like that. Um, but then finally the plane starts to descend and you land and you're on the ice in Antarctica. They open the door, you take that first small step. I love space stuff, so it's like the first step in Antarctica. <laughs> um, and then you're there. Um, you get on this weird bus thing that takes you over to McMurdo Station, which I showed you guys earlier. Um, and eventually you arrive, and there you are. You're in McMurdo, the same place you've seen in all the movies and looked about and seen on maps, but you're there. And it's actually not that desolate. It really is kind of like a city. Um, you know, we'd, uh, we'd be able to go on hikes and see these really amazing views just around the perimeter. We had dorm rooms that are, you know, like a dorm room in a college. There was a place to do exercise and stuff like that. 
Um, the food was really good. There's something missing from that one because they had just eaten it, but almost all of my plates um, also had uh, jello. You can see in the lower left hand corner. It turns out that that's a staple food of, of me. Um, there were dance parties. I mean, this is, this, is uh, this big party that they had there. I mean, it was really, you felt like you're at home. You could be in any small town in the US. Um, but of course you have to, oh, there was a Halloween party. That's Lachlan there. <laughs> So yeah, you can see it's, it's a pretty big city, but you have to get ready to be out in the field. If you're on one of the science teams, you're gonna be out in the snow um, and the ice. You could get stuck out there, so they have this thing called um, Happy Camper, which is where they teach you how to survive on the ice if you get stuck there. Um, if you've seen Werner Hartzog's movie, you can, you can learn about that. Um, I, uh, my part I had heard about is you have to build these ice huts, these kind of things that if you have to spend the night, you know, how do you stay warm? And apparently, by making these these kind of like roof things over a pit, you know, the pit kind of keeps you out of the wind and the roof thing keeps you insulated, presumably, if you plug it right. And I, I did mine really well. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was in Boy Scouts and all this, I covered it with tons of snow. I was like, this is gonna insulate me. Everyone's gonna be miserable, I'm gonna be great. I was not great. It was, it was so cold. I, okay, this is being recorded. Let me just say, um, everything that has that goes out on the ice has to come back. It's a very pristine environment. Everything. So if you drink a lot of water, that fluid in any form is going to end up having to come back with you. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, and I had this bally clob on. You can see it there. And I woke up, and it was like it was stiff, and I kind of peeled it off, and the ice was just frozen in my mouth, and it was cold. I didn't think I had feet anymore. I didn't think I had fingers anymore. And I you should mention that's the middle of. The Oh yeah, this is about two in the morning, by the way. Uh, this is, I took this photo while waking up in the middle of the night and I was like, there's no way I'm gonna sleep, what else do you do? I'll take some pictures. <laughs> Good point. Um, but I remember I also had to go pee, and so I, you know, you have these pee bottles, and I did that, and I have never held anything so fondly <laughs> that kept me warm. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you learn a lot of uh, survival techniques in Antarctica, including, um, uh, I'll move forward. Um, so um, basically, uh, you know, you learn a lot and then you're able to get out there and do what you're meant to do, get to work. Um, for us, um, it was all about, you know, going out to this field site. And I wanted to give you an idea of what it's like in the morning. You wake up, I, this is like a day in the life of me. I'd wake up way too late, you know, I have to be down at the lab so we can get ready. Um, I, you know, you, it's always light, so you have to open this little window blinder thing and then put clothes on and stuff. I fast forwarded that because it's a long process. Um, <laughs> but basically, just kind of give you an idea of what it's like. So you put on all your clothes, you walk down the hall of this dorm room, um, you go out, you have to grab something to eat. This is, I think, 14 times speed. Um, this is called hall, uh, Highway 1. It's this hallway in the middle of the main building, kind of mess hall. You have to put on a ton of sunscreen because there's a lot of light out there um, reflecting off the snow eat as much sugary food as possible, <laughs> um, get your stuff. And then um, it's time to head to uh, Creary, which is the science lab. And that's just a little ways down from the, the main hall. Um, so you go in there, um, there's a bunch of other science labs. It's, it's quite a big building. It's in three levels, we're kind of at the bottom one. Um, you go in, you put on some clothes, and then you're ready to go. Um, so as I mentioned, we have to drive out about 20, to around 20 kilometers out to this area where um, inspecting. At first we started using snow machines to get out there, so um, this is just kind of footage of that. We leave um, McMurdo Station in the morning um, and get underway. A bunch of us would be there. You can see we're not really carrying that much gear, and that's because a lot of the essential gear we put in this thing called a piston bully, which you'll see in just a moment. That's this thing. It's like a tank. It, no one really cares that it only goes like 10 miles an hour because it'll go 10 miles an hour over anything. Um, and uh, so we coordinated so the piston bully leaves earlier and then presumably the snow machines and the piston bully would arrive at the site at the same time. And that worked great until the snow got too thin and then the piston bully is too heavy, you can't take it on the ice. So, oh my god, this is the best part. You get to take help. Darn it! <laughs> Every single Anyway, um, we, uh, so we um, we take helicopters, we land on the ice, we had our stuff, you know, uh, screwed down there. Um, we unload all this stuff. The helicopter would still be running, so it feels really cool. Um, I took tons of footage of that just because I thought somehow like, later on I'd edit it into something that would make people think I'm cool. Um, I see this. This looks pretty cool, right? Uh, then the helicopter would take off. Uh, this is a second clip I found in like 17 clips I went through where no one's throwing a gang sign. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and then we'd, we'd uh, do that. So anyway, once our stuff is there, however we got it there, we set up this field camp. It's got a tent where we operate the ROV out of. We've got the ROV. We're doing some other scientific, science experiments. We drill a hole with this jiffy drill. Um, it just makes a 10-inch hole in the ice. Uh, as you guys saw from the photo earlier, we put the system um, down the hole, um, and then we start doing, start doing our science. Um, so the, the ice here is a meter or two meters thick, something like that. Um, uh, we just use a little hole to push it down, and then when we're pulling it back up, we just pull on the tether, basically, and it would come back out. Um, I don't have very much underwater footage uh, to show you, but you can kind of guess what it's like. Our control station, at first we had four monitors. You can see on the right is the operating screen. There's navigation, the science data, and then um, um, some other data. We eventually condensed it to two computers. Um, now this is a section I, I call McGuy Veneering. Um, this is one of the main job descriptions, particularly of, of Lachlan and I, um, for being down in Antarctica, which is make stuff work, keep it working, basically. We had two ROVs down there, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they're able to operate, that we always have at least one ROV, um, because everyone who's on our team is relying on those ROVs being able to work. And when you don't have a radio shack or McMaster car or, or places to, to get parts from, um, that can be very challenging. It's a really big concern. So we'd have this lab. We'd always be working there. At first, we worked on some basic problems, like, for instance, if you have a bottle of wine you need to open, how can you open it without a corkscrew? And it turned out that this method was one that a lot of people in Antarctica used. Uh, for instance, stirring coffee was, I mean, you know, hand drills are wonderful tools. But then we, we got into some more serious, I guess, actual engineering. Um, we had to, um, of course, make sure the ROVs are nice and neutrally buoyant. Um, we had this test tank, but actually they, they had caught some moss in it, these very large, uh, they're called toothfish sometimes. Um, and so we were kind of sharing the tank with them. Um, but you know, you make use of what you have. We do, we do buoyancy testing of our ROV in the same tank. As them. They're big fish. They're obviously, they're much heavier than the ROV and, and they're longer too. I mean, this one I think swims behind it. You can see that they're, they're very large. Skinny is, ah, four in feet, I guess it would be four four and a half feet long, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's sufficient. That's sufficient, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so then we'd have some problems, like the lights would flood and we'd have to figure out how to deal with that. Later on, the problems, is almost as if someone was deliberately doing this, like they were, they were escalating how complex the problem was we had to solve each time. It's like once we get to that level, okay, the next thing to happen is gonna be even harder to challenge, you know, even more of a challenge. So flooded light was like something we practiced. Like we knew how to deal with that. That was something we expected might happen in the field. Um, this is one where a tether, this is our main tether going to the ROV and like it has this big fancy connector that's like permanently attached to the tether and a pin pulled out of that. It rendered that connector useless. And we're out in the field. That's the only option we've got. You know, we looked at it in a microscope. There's no way to repair it. It's corroded. So using like a syringe outer bit and some epoxy, we figured out how to fix it. Then we started getting into like really more sophisticated problems. like electrical noise issues. Um, those are really hard because they're not mechanical. You can't just look at it and be like, oh, that's the problem. We had all this noise in the signal and we weren't sure where it was coming from. Um, and we scratched our heads about that quite a bit, but we had to get out back on the field. It turned out that there was a grounding <laughs> thing that had to be around the wire that we were provided. The wire we were given didn't have that. Um, and actually, well, it's too hard to reverse, but basically we found that we could wrap tinfoil around it to get better. And then problems got even worse. Um, the, the next one that happened was really a doozy. Um, we were having shorting issues with some of the high voltage power lines that were really close to low voltage power lines. And all of a sudden, the, the, the system wouldn't work and we test all these separate individual modules of the RV and each individual module wouldn't work for a seemingly a different reason. Like how can you have the same problem happen in all of these at the same time? It's really unlikely. Um, so using all, you know, logic analyzer stuff we had never done before, we figured out what the problem was. And it only was because, you know, we we're kind of forced to develop very good engineering methods. Like, you know, the, technically how to do something that you learn in the classroom is not anything like, okay, you're in the field, you really have to come up with an organizational structure that'll help you solve these problems systematically. So like all parts have to be inventoried, you have to figure out where they go, you keep a very thorough list of where, where all those things are. Um, we came up with this kind of, um, I think you could call it like a fish scale chart of like, okay, if this is the problem, here are two different things. It could be electrical issue or it could be an instrumentation issue. Okay, within each of those, if it's electrical, could it be the power bus or thing? Within the instrumentation, could it be that this sensor is not. <coughs> so you kind of go through all these and you check things off. And you don't only check things off of this can't be the problem, but you also 
I call it NCA, no change in action. You look at the things where if that's a problem, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, and you just don't waste your time on that because you know, you're, you're screwed if you do, screwed if you don't. Let's, in case it's the other problem, let's look at those first. So we had to develop these really complex ways of solving very complex problems, um, and eventually they worked. Um, so for that system, that problem I was talking about turned out it was this chip, you can see there's a little burnt out area. That chip exists in three different spots on the ROV, and they all simultaneously burnt out when a high voltage line got attached to the bus. Um, so anyway, this was a great engineering education for me, the experience for me, because you know we kind of kept on leveling up and these things we had to repair in the field. We pulled those chips out of other electronics that we found around base and, and were able to MacGyver the ROV back into working order. But it was, it was no fault, small feet and uh, have to thank Lachlan for uh, two of us working together on that. It was, it was great to have a good team on it. Um, so Wizard was this other kind of smaller part of why we went down to Antarctica. Um, they were drilling this really deep hole with this um, ice drill. And so we made a special kind of adap adapter to Skinny that would allow it to go down this very deep hole. And this is kind of like a Europa analog. If you're going to drill a deep hole in the ice of Jupiter's moon Europa, um, you know, how would you send an ROV down it, I guess, and how would you look under the ice? Um, so this one, I have a kind of space background. This one was really cool for me because it's really close to what a space mission would be like. You're going to a very mysterious, dark place where there's a lot of potential things go wrong. And you spend a lot of time engineering all this stuff for one day. We had one less than 24 hour period to do this deployment. Um, and the, the, the part that stood out to me the most um, was this one aspect of the mission where we had to hold on to this weight with a gripper arm. And the weight is meant to keep skinny oriented vertically. And then when we get to the bottom of the hole, we let go of the weight and skinny orients horizontally. But there have been a lot of problems with the robot arm that we were using where it wouldn't let go when it's under a lot of pressure. Some mechanical part of it would fail. And we tested this time and time again, and we still weren't completely certain it would work. We were just going to have to do our best. We had some backup systems like a piece of foam that would collapse if the pressure got too high and be released and all these other things. But we had essentially spent, you know, Way before leaving for Antarctica, we had many conference calls talking about how this would work. We spent months in design talking about it, you know, right before, the week before this mission. We spent all this time getting it ready. So all of these months and months of preparation come down to the split second when we press that button and we see if that weight releases. That, if you look in the upper left screen, I've been told I have a laser pointer here. Right? If you look at this little white dot, that's the weight. It's a little bit washed out from the light. And what we're gonna do, there's no audio, so you can't hear the, the noises, but this is like that mission control moment where they're waiting to hear back from the Mars rover that touches down. So we're looking at that dot, we get ready to press the, the release button, and it releases. It was an extremely awesome feeling. I mean, all that preparation <laughs> made you a few seconds, that's me clapping. So that was really cool. I mean, that mission was great, and it was a success. We looked around, we were flying between like two in the morning and seven in the morning or something. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a good Antarctic presentation if I didn't talk about penguins. And um, yeah, like I mentioned, we saw them. We saw a lot of penguins. We saw these emperors, which are very beautiful, you know, very majestic. They make a cool noise. But my personal favorite was the Adelis. They're just ridiculously cute and dorky, and they're kind of dopey. I mean, they're awkward. I relate to them. Um, <laughs> And uh, so they come and they just kind of investigate stuff. They you know, chew on our floats, you're like, ah, don't, that's our equipment. But you're not allowed to interfere with them. You have to kind of just let them do their thing. And the thing is, I think they know it. I think that they know that they're kind of, they can just do whatever they want. And they rub it in, you know, like they come and just make us wait while they hang out. And, and I, I'm, I'm so sure of this fact that they know it. I just want to show you a few clips of them like mocking us basically. When we're doing all of this hard work, you know, whenever we're working the hardest, they come out of nowhere and just stand there and be like, yeah, 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 yeah I that thing. And they just watch. <laughs> like they just stand there. And, uh, you, you do the work, darn penguin guy. But they never did. They just watched. And it was cool to have a company. I really like them. And here's another thing. We're lowering them. They just come and watch. The Delis, they're curious. And even renowned penguin researchers will tell you that they're not super intelligent. You wouldn't want to be if you have to spend half the year in the dark on the ice. Um, but they're great, and I love them, and I wish I could take them home, but they didn't fit in my case, and apparently there's regulations about it. Um, so I also got this great opportunity I just have to show in the presentation. Uh, I had brought a tuxedo down to Antarctica because I heard there were penguins, and in my mind, okay, if I bring a tuxedo, <laughs> if all the stars line up, you know, it could get, you know, have this perfect opportunity. So 
There was one day that I brought the tuxedo out on the ice. It was just one day, like it was going to be warm weather, there's going to be no wind, we were, looks like we're going to have kind of a loose schedule, you know, or a fairly open schedule. So there I am, suiting up into the tux, and um, just magic happened. <laughs> uh, that's Clint taking a photo of me. We were able to capture what is now <laughs> one of my favorite photos, and Clint's a photographer. I, it was just amazing. Um, like I said before, Adelis are my favorite penguin. Um, we just get each other. So I also got to bring an open ROV down to the ice and deploy it very briefly, albeit, but I can say it's flown under the ice. Uh, this is a photo taken from Skinny with pilot uh, Lachlan Barker in command. This is a view from Skinny looking up at the ice with the ROV looking at these um, little bits of um, algae, which you'll, you'll see later. Um, and that was just really cool. And I, I was trying to kind of put in some open ROV in Antarctica photos um, to make a good segue, and I wasn't sure how to do that. But long story short, um, during our last dive, you know, when we were finally putting away our field camp for the last time and bringing Skinny and Fatty out of the water, um, you can see how much the current is there. Um, and uh, there's parts cut out too. You can, there's all these other aspects from deploying the ROV that we learned from this. But it was a very sentimental moment. I mean, you realize that you've just seen one of the most extreme places on the planet. Um, you've seen stuff that people have never seen before, and the science is amazing. Um, I knew I was going to miss it, and I miss it. I'll always miss it. Um, but the, the experience is one that I'll never forget. I wanted to make a segue between um, the skinny Antarctica thing and open ROV. And so I had a photo of um, the two of them together, and I thought that would just be a good way to kind of segue between the two. Um, but unfortunately, uh, what happened is that, uh, well, what happened is that Clint photobombed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, anyway, that is, that is that presentation. <laughs> And um, I have the next section, which is open ROV stuff. I've been told I have an hour to talk about all this stuff. But about Antarctica, are there any questions kind of in this middle bit that anyone ha has yet? There are people far more qualified than I am to answer questions about Antarctica sitting right here. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, I wanted to share that bit with you. OK, so the next one is um, kind of the more related to the topic um, uh, Thing, which is open ROV and make a movement. Let's see if this works here. It does, okay. Um, so all of this does kind of fit together. The reason I ultimately ended up on the Skinny Project and going to Antarctica was because I started building this little robotic submarine and someone saw me doing that and said, hey, I'm part of this project that does stuff and you should be a part of it too. And I was just, I was working at NASA at the time and I just started grad school. I, my, I had to be loyal to the people who got me there, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't. I sent, I referred a friend who ended up going, and then the next season, the friend re-referred me. Anyway, um, open ROV is where it all started for me, and it's probably where it'll all end for me. Um, we've figured out a way of making these really low-cost robotic submarines. They send live video up to the surface, and the big concept is that it shouldn't take a research grant to do exploration. It should take curiosity. A person who wants to know about you know, what the majority of the Earth is, what it looks like, should be able to just explore it. Um, you know, the majority of the planet should be able to be seen by the majority of its people. Um, so we're all about democratizing exploration, and a big part of what we are is um, we're part of the Make Movement. We're part of this, this new era where the tools and technology needed to do something extraordinary, extraordinary are just as easy for an individual to get as they are for, um, you know, a, a big corporation or, or government to get. Um, so I wanted to give you guys just a little bit of background on the Maker Movement. Oh, this works, cool. Uh, Maker Fair is probably the best way to see a demonstration of the Maker Movement. It's like Burning Man meets a show and tell versus meets, you know, some weird mad scientists. People make rockets. You know, there's kids playing with Legos. Um, there's um, there's all sorts of stuff. This guy made a full-size mouse trap oh, thing. That's <laughs> that's, oh, he, he gets great. cars donated. He actually drops this that huge, like, two-ton ball on a car and crushes it afterward. I mean, people are making things that they're interested in. It's not that they're making it for money or that they're doing it. They're just like, you can build whatever you want. You could build a <laughs> cupcake and dry, dress like Santa and drive around in a cupcake if you want, I guess. Um, but as silly as it is, there's actually some pretty cool stuff. This guy made a fusion, a nuclear fusion reactor in his garage. The kind of things that individuals are able to make are really extraordinary. It just gets me thinking 
you know, about the kind of technology that we get excited about, if you're interested in it, you could do it. And what comes to mind for me, of course, being the space nerd that I am, is like, I think this is Phoenix Lander, is a, is a Mars landing. You know, you've seen them on TV when, you know, it's happening and there's all this suspense and you're watching something go down. The reason tons of people are watching is the emotional aspect. You know, there's mission tool, like they've just done it. You know, they've done something that's never been done before. They've seen something. It gets people's attention. This is um, Times Square, you know, watching when the Mars Science Lander landed. This is our own NASA Ames Research Center when the Mars Science Lo Rover landed. Um, it gets people's attention like nothing else. And it's not because they're excited about what the pH level of the soil is or something like that. <laughs> it's because there's something deeper. There's something about exploration that's innately human, um, about the suspense and the curiosity of what will happen, what's around the next corner. And makers are, I think, the perfect, the perfect group to meet with the science community. Because scientists understand data and they understand, they understand understanding. That's what science is all about, figuring out how things work. But a lot of times that figuring out bit is kind of uh, a mystery. How, how do you go about finding things? Um, there's experimental methods, but a lot of times exploration um, follows technology. You know, it's, it, the development of technology precedes ex, um, what you can explore. And so makers are people who are going to be able to make the new devices that allow us to go in the new realm. And there's so much out there to explore. I, I started out being really interested in space exploration, but then I realized it's a lot of nothing. Unless you are actually landing on an asteroid or a moon or a planet, you're not going to see creatures, you're not going to see anything like that. You're just kind of floating. But we have this whole world, which you guys are very familiar with, below the waterline. And there are alien-looking species that really exist, and you can see them. In fact, if you, can go, if you can go below 200 meters, you're very likely to see something that's never been seen before. Um, you know, th these are just ridiculous things that live there. They really exist, you know? And I mean, a lot of you are looking at this and you know what all these are, but if I show this to a group of students or a group, I mean, they don't believe that this is actually out, out there. This is only a fraction of, of what you could find. It turns out that something like 96% of where life can exist on this planet has never been explored. Um, so how do we do that? How do we make exploration possible for everyone? Right now it requires quite an elaborate setup. This is um, actually, you guys have probably seen this exact console. This is um, Ambari's console. I think they're flying the Mintana in this, but I'm not sure. Um, this is a lot like mission control, um, in my opinion. I mean, you're, you're, at, you're looking at this monitor trying to see what's around the next corner. Um, and so it's all about the story. That's what I've been talking about before. And, and I have a story, and I have to tell the story because it's, it's a large part of how we started. But you need to get people's excitement. And, um, how it started for me was I, I wanted to build an ROV. I already knew I wanted to do that. I, the lab I was working with had them, and, and it seemed cool. And I started asking around about cool stories. Um, and a friend told me this story about a cave that has treasure in the bottom of it, and no one's ever found it. It's all underwater. Um, I've condensed the story into like a minute and 43 seconds, and I can tell it really quickly if you guys are interested. I, is that, would that yes. be good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Gold, technology, danger. Um, okay, uh, well, hold on, we do my story telling stretches. Okay. Uh, so here's how the story goes. Flashback, mid-1800s, middle of the gold rush, Northern California, two Native American men rob a gold mining operation, making away with an estimated 100 pounds of gold after killing the two guys they rob. Um, it's the Wild West, they're trying to discourage settlers from coming in. It's not that they want the gold, they want the settlers to not have the gold. Anyway, they're making a run for it, the gold's weighing them down, so they ditch it. They, they hide it somewhere to try to get away from a sheriff posse coming after them. And the posse catches up with them anyway afterward and says, tell us where you hid the gold and we'll spare your lives. Both men said they hid it in this cave, which is now known as the Hall City Cave. Despite the posse's promise, both men were hung on the spot. The posse goes to the cave, they go to the very back of it, and all they find reportedly is a puddle. Um, they say that what they see is this almost perfectly circular, roughly six foot, roughly two meter diameter hole going straight down as far as they could see, presuming the gold was thrown down there with no technology to explore it at the time, they give up. Years go by, flash forward to the 1980s, uh, a treasure hunter who um, hears about this story, hires an old man to take him up into the mountains um, and explore this cave where presumably there's gold. He reportedly finds the cave using snuba, which is like scuba diving as you know, but with a kind of an air hose that delivers it down to you, he goes down the maximum length of his hose, 50 feet, uh, and uh, shines his waterproof flashlight down, the hole just keeps on going as far as he can see. It's bottomless. He almost dies during that trip. There have been other attempts as well, and, and from what we what I was reading more and more, no one has ever been able to find the bottom of this cave, especially not the gold. In fact, we didn't even know if the cave existed. Here's where it is. It's in Northern California, Trinity Alps. 
So I went, I launched an expedition. Well, really, I just went with some buddies into the mountains and we looked around for a couple days. And um, just kind of by chance, we remembered one of the stories talking about where these two mountains kind of converge and there's a switchback creek. Um, we looked around and there we found this granite outcropping. Like, okay. And in the granite outcropping, there was a cave. Like, oh my God, this is just like the story describes. And we go into the cave, and there in the back is this puddle. Like, oh my God, this, this story could be true. But we didn't see a perfectly circular hole, we just saw a puddle. It was only after shining our flashlight just the right angle that we could see about, uh, about a foot below the water line was this circular hole, perfectly circular hole, six foot in diameter, just like described in the story. So we were interested. There it was. You can see in the very, very back there, you can kind of see the outline of this circular shape. Um, so we had to explore it. And um, I started designing this ROV, which at the time looked like that. It had these two tubes forward and aft. It was laser cut. The, the, the design of it specifically wasn't at all what we ended up with, but the concept is the same, which is it should be very rapidly iterable. It should use low cost, off the shelf parts. We got near it. Um, so I met David, my co founder. And he's an amazing guy. He, he understands the community aspect, um, how to get everyone involved. And so we started doing things. We put together a website called openrv.com where we asked the internet for help. You know, we didn't know what we were doing, but other people do. Everyone is smarter than anyone. And the forums, at first it was just him and me talking back and forth on the forums, but they started to grow. And eventually we ended up with a, a robot that looked like that. And we went back to the cave and explored it. Um, it's got these thrusters in the back, a vertical thruster on the top. Um, it's all off the shelf parts. Um, here's some specs for what it, its capabilities are. Um, and we went to explore the cave. And it was, it was a big success. It landed us a story in the New York Times. Um, and things just started taking off. And all the meanwhile, we're building it with parts that you'd find in you know, your average kind of consumer electronics store. This is a home plug adapter. You plug it into your wall if your house doesn't have Ethernet. And it talks Ethernet through your power line. But if you take it apart, it turns out there's a specific one you can take apart and use just the communication part without having to send the power down to the water, which is dangerous. Um, and so kind of cleverly misusing off-the-shelf parts is what we're all about. This way we're able to talk 200 megabits over a thin tether. We use a motor that um, you'd use for an RC airplane. You can just buy it. Um, they, turns out they work great in water. Um, we even salt water, we've been doing a lot of tests recently. And even if they do eventually corrode, they're $10 a piece. Um, the webcam is a high-definition 1080p USB webcam. So we're able to get extremely good resolution, very low cost off the shelf part. Um, so we put this kit together um, and we started selling it on Kickstarter. The idea is, okay, enough people seem interested in this, um, let's launch it. And what our goal was, was we wanted to raise $20,000 to kind of start building these, to start doing the research. So we launched on Kickstarter with the goal to raise 20K um, and we ended up hitting that very quickly. Um, if you're if you're a technical person, this is kind of the layout of how it works. There's a computer up at the top. We talk this home plug adapter with an Ethernet cable that turns Ethernet into two wires. There's this runaway loop where if you have a tether, it has a lot of drag in the water, so you need bigger thrusters, which means you need a bigger tether to provide the power, which means the tether is bigger, which means you need bigger thrusters, and it just spirals. So we knew early on we wanted the thinnest possible tether. Um, we talked to a BeagleBone, which is running Linux, that's also hosting a web server, listening to the webcam. I don't know how technical you guys are, but this kind of shows how that works. Um, yeah, and so we went back to the cave, we explored it with the ROV, it was amazing. Um, then we launched Kickstarter, we got our $20,000 in about two and a half hours, and it kept on going. Wow. The thing was a huge hit. Um, everyone wanted one, we realized how big this community can be. I mean, the number that we're excited about isn't that one, it's that one. There were 484 people who, when they saw this, said, I, I want to be a part of this, I want to be a part of this project. Um, and that's extremely interesting to us. I mean, you know, as an educator, I'd say you get a B if you can teach a student something in the classroom. But if you can make someone go home and teach themselves that they want to do it, it's like their hobby, that's when you get an A. Um, and I hope that that's what we're doing. We're exciting people about what there is to explore. Um, of course, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, so this was all happening right at the time that all the skinny work was happening. It was much bigger than I had ever expected. And so this is my garage in Cupertino, and we started getting all these parts and we had to pack those boxes, we're up. there were you know, literally over 100 ROVs we had to build and send out. And in the meantime, we're leaving to Antarctica. Well, it was gonna be in one time, then actually got pushed forward by a month. And all of this was, I was sleeping hardly at all. I was trying to manage this. David isn't a technical guy, really, and so he wasn't gonna be. So it was just this really, really, really tough time of, of trying to get an entire ROV manufacturing company started while also kind of getting stuff ready for Antarctica and preparing for that. I have the greatest amount of respect to Stacy, 
uh, for putting up with me during that phase of my life, which is probably one of the most challenging periods I've ever been as far as discombobulation is concerned. But we got it done. We got it done. We shipped, um, we shipped 128 ROVs out into the world initially with the Kickstarter project. Um, a lot of the ones we sold as kits, not as assembled ones like you see here, and that was done while I was in Antarctica. Um, and uh, then right after I got back, I finished out with um, building these assembled ones. And now we've really grown. Since Kickstarter, we've launched four more batches of ROVs that are outside of Kickstarter. Um, we've now got members, uh, we've got more than 3,000 members across 50 countries. Um, there is over, we serialize each ROV. Um, we're now over serial number 1,000. Um, and so this is, this is getting really big. By now, we're by volume the, hard, high, the highest volume ROV manufacturer in the world. Um, and um, the things that people are doing with these is really amazing. That's my favorite part. This is Dominic in Australia. He's built some, he's gonna go uh, look at uh, a certain type of fish that lives there. This is, I mean, people, even things that are not, that you wouldn't think of if you're just a scientist. This is Jessica in New York. She's looking in lakes that are rumored to have lake monsters. She doesn't know <laughs> what she'll find, but she's just gonna check it out. Um, this is this guy, Peter in Norway. He's got this big light on the top. I think he does stuff with um, fluorescence. Um, and he's exploring. Norwegians love open ROVs. We sell a lot there. Um, this is Adam. He's one of our main software developers, and his kids, um, I guess one of his kids' friends, um, they came out. He's, ah! I, well, because uh, this, is, this is Hunter and Aiden, and I don't know who that is. Um, but anyway, um, so Dominic, um, Dominic and Brian, Dominic's the guy in the first image, and Brian are like our main software developers. Um, we're all open source. That means that we rely on the community to develop stuff. And um, it's amazing. Um, the, the kind of things that these people create are things that we never think of. The, the ideas that other people have are the ones we're most excited about. This is part of the make movement. It's not just open ROV, but it's happening around everywhere in the world. There's um, this guy who's making a, um, this like boat, basically, to go around and take samples. There's a guy in France who's making a um, autonomous dynamic positioning system, so you could make the ROV go out on its own um, and fly. There's a guy who's doing an open uh, CTD, uh, open source CTD. I mean, if you can rely on a community, there's some amazing stuff you can do. Um, and what we think of is, is like Charles Dobson with the Dobsonian telescope. You know, he created this telescope that was really low cost, and um, it would allow kind of everyday people to see something that normally you wouldn't be able to. He, he did for amateur astronomy what we hope to do with oceanography. Um, and the movement's just getting big. You guys are probably familiar with DIY drones and drones and how popular those are. And this is Chris Anderson, he used to be the publisher, the editor in chief of Wired. And with his kid using Legos, they made this you know, autonomous airplane that could fly around and take photos. And that's now turned into you know, a many tens of millions of dollars industry because of what they've done. Um, in the same garage that I started Open ROV in, you know, when you're seeing those boxes, uh, these are some of my friends who started a company called Planet Labs, um, building satellites. They wanted to build Earth imaging satellites that could take images of the Earth daily and give them to everyone in the public. Imagine what you could do for deforestation, for mass immigration, you know, migration of species or people, or you know, ships leaving harbors, or any of that. Um, and of course, it didn't seem very practical. They're just some guys doing this in a garage. This is 27 satellites that they've built. Um, not only did they build them, they launched them and they're returning images of the Earth. This is happening, and it's happening from everyday people. You can build these things in your garage. The technology that's gonna revolutionize the way exploration is done in the future is, is upon us, and it's gonna look a lot different in the future. And, you know, people talk about citizen science, it should, really be, it should really be more like the molding of amateur curiosity with science. I mean, if you look at this Venn diagram, okay, there's a small place where they overlap, but what it's really gonna be like is you know, there's tons of people asking tons of questions, and even if it's not with a hypothesis, um, you know, that's a huge community. I mean, think of the WhatsApp thing that just sold for, what, $19 billion, and compare that to the NASA budget of, like, you know, less than $10 billion, and then the NOAA budget, which is, like, a few million dollars, basically. Um, you know, the kind of things you can do when you have a, a gross amount of public doing, um, those things are phenomenal. So, anyway, uh, we ended up with this ROV. This is basically what we have now. Uh, we can go to 100 meter depth. It's doing some amazing things. We've taken it to Lake Tahoe. It's flown under the ice in Antarctica. Um, this is an image from the ROV during that flight in Antarctica of the, some of the algae growing at the bottom. Um, and penguins love robots. <laughs> so um, anyway, there's a ton of stuff that can be done in the future.
How am I for time? I've got a few minutes left. There's a five minute video clip I wanted to show just to kind of show you where all this is going. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll kind of finish these slides first. The future is what's really exciting. We're about, tomor um, tomorrow we're leaving for Lake Tahoe where we're going to dive on a hundred, uh, a 52 meter long sunken steamship um, that's in like 150 meters depth and hardly anyone's seen it since it went down. And the way we're doing it is we're gonna have a control console at our cabin, we have a small boat with a wireless link, so we don't even have to actually be out on the boat. We can be warm, drinking coffee. I mean, we're talking to a guy now who's gonna use the same system. Um, we're literally talking about deploying an ROV from a quadcopter that would fly out, it lands on the water, it's waterproof, it deploys the ROV out of the garage and comes back up. I mean, the technology is amazing. Different ways of building the cockpit, so you have all these things. Um, if you guys have heard of the Oculus Rift, it's this kind of virtual reality goggle, and as you move your head, you can look around. Um, we're working on an ROV that has um, spherical imaging, so it's looking in every direction all at once. And I picture a classroom of students and a teacher, let's call her Miss Frizzle, if you've ever watched Magic School Bus, piloting an ROV via tele telepresence over the internet. It could be somewhere else in the world, flying through some underwater canyon, and the students are able to each look around in their own way, and say, oh, what's that? You know, the, other students look over and they're all looking and if it's really interesting, the teacher can go fly it over. I mean, the, the potential of, of the technology that's emerging right now is just phenomenal. Um, and I guess I wanted to just kind of bring it full circle and say like anything's possible. And that's what we're excited about. It's not what we're planning. The make movement is all about what everyone thinks of and putting all those ideas together. So um, the last thing I'd like to just show you is where we've gone so far. I'm talking a lot, so interrupt me if there's any questions you have that you need to ask. But, um, so, all these people flying ROVs around, we've gotten some amazing footage. Fish swarm around the ROV and we're not sure why. People are flying one ROV with another ROV. You know, what, what can you do if your team diving with them? Um, I mean, it's really cool to just send these things out and start getting, getting videos back from people of how they're using them. Um, this next one is a dive in Tahoe. We were dying. We didn't know that there were scuba divers down there, and they didn't know we were down there. We were surprised. <laughs> I think they were really nice to us. Um, but they happened to have some photography gear, and they later emailed me a really great photo of the ROV flying in there. Um, there was a shipwreck. I mean, this is, if I, my eight year old self would have gone gaga for this, we found a sunken sailboat at about 20 meters depth. And um, I mean, it was just amazing. There's fish swimming out there, so that's like, okay, there must be a hole. So we're debating, okay, it's really risky. Should we go inside? We're all arguing, I don't know, should we go in or not? I was piloting, I was like, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> the ROV costs under $1,000, so you can do that. And we go inside this shipwreck, and then, you know, there's oh, fish swimming around, there's, I mean, it's just amazing. This shipwreck lying on its side with all these fish in it, and, uh, and uh, there's, forget about my bad piloting here, don't feel safe, you don't want that. that it's long, it's long. Um, I mean, you know, like, we were looking around, and we found this, like, there's, like, an old coffee, um, tin there and like all this stuff. I mean, I've never seen this ship in person. I've never seen that sailboat with my own eyes, but I know all about it. I know what's inside it because of this technology we've been able to create. I don't want you to see too much of my bad pilot. I'm just going to skip forward here. Not, not, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Look, we got out of the boat. That was <laughs> um, This is a cenote in Mexico. One of our the people in our community went cave diving. This is the first footage I've seen of an ROV collaborating with a scuba diver. You saw he was just making a gesture and he's flashing the lights either turn the lights on to say yes or turn the lights off to say no. Um, so he was following these cave divers who are diving with National Geographic into this kind of undisclosed location, cenote, that has Mayan pottery in it. Um, and here's one he's, he was suggesting, I later heard he was suggesting to turn left, and he was going to say, no, I can't turn left, so he'll assume, turn the light off and then back on. Um, and then, um, so, I mean, it's just cool learning how to communicate this way. And this guy, He's not scuba certified, so he was able to come along with these divers. And then finally, we get to this spot inside of the cave. He's saying, "Hey, look over here!" And so you know, he pulls, he drives the ROV over to the left. This is all just with the gamepad controller. And you know, there's something up there. And so he kind of later on maneuvers around. And um, what we were able to see with this ROV uh, was something really incredible. Um, when I saw this footage after after we got it back, I was really amazed. Um, but here's some pottery that's just sitting on this ledge of this cave. Um, and so he was able to just set the ROV right down there and look at it for a while. I mean, it's just, it's the feeling of creating something and sharing that idea with people and seeing what it does is, is just really amazing. 
And what the people can do is amazing too. Like these, these lights, these are scaling lasers we have. They're parallel lights, as you guys are familiar. They're 10 centimeters apart. Someone, this originally wasn't in the footage, someone wrote a computer program that looks at the apparent separation of the lights and tells you how far away objects are. We didn't create it, someone else did, and they emailed it to us. They're like, oh, here's a software you can add to your ROV. So now we have range finding with the ROV. You know, the best ideas are the ones we're not gonna come up with. They're the ones that are community built. I mean, if we're you know, 3,000 strong and growing. Um, so I think that that does a good job of illustrating what an open source community can do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm continuously impressed by this, and I think that the best is, is yet to come. Um, then the last, last little bit of footage here is my favorite. This is a night dive, I, that's me, um, that we did in the Sea of Cortez. We just got back last month. And we started diving down the anchor chain. We saw these little white dots, these little things swimming around. There's some sort of copepod? Maybe. <laughs> I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, <laughs> but we backed away and we found out just like moths, they really like light. And when I say that they, they, they really like light, I mean like they really like light. And the longer we waited, the more they came. And then eventually it started getting overwhelmed. There were so many, we couldn't see where we were going. And we, we realized the only way to, to see anything was to outfly them, you know, just kind of outrun them. But once we did, um, the kind of things that we saw are amazing. I mean, it's just happening there. So first we saw this little like fern thing, and then we noticed, oh, there's something in the back. What's that? It's like, oh, oh it's a puffer fish. Wait, that's like, is that a skate? What is that? <laughs> we didn't know. You know, so we're flying around, and these things are just down there. I mean, these adventures can be had by everybody who has access to something like this, even if you're not a scuba diver. And eventually, even if you don't have water through an internet connection, we hope that open RVs will be something you can pilot anywhere in the world. I, I heard that puffer fish, if they're intimidated, will puff up to intimidate you know, their predator. And so, of course, in the interest of science, I had to experiment with that. Um, <laughs> there's another one. So, I mean, this, this goes on for a bit, but long story short, you know, we followed this guy for like three minutes, and I kind of started getting closer and closer, and he still wouldn't puff up. At, at some point, I think it happens just after this, I got so impatient, I actually kind of nudged him a bit, and kind of scurries off a bit. He still didn't puff. My hypothesis, <laughs> scientist, is that the ROV is far too small and cute to be intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's basically that's basically all I have. That is that is in a nutshell what we're all about. And I hope I've been able to communicate to you that it's not just what Open ROV is; it's the movement that we're trying to be a part of and the potential that that has. So thank you guys very much. turns out that our third expedition, which is the one where we were going to go the deepest, about a, uh, two weeks before we went, a large dive team using rebreathers in coordination with the Cal Academy of Sciences went to the cave with all this equipment. Um, they apparently also didn't find any gold or the end of the cave, but um, they were really friendly. I and mean, we talked back and forth a lot. They were very interested in footage from what we got with the ROV. So it's kind of an unclosed story. Uh, yeah, second question. Um, with a lot of your work seem to be um, underwater, do you feel limited by visibility, and is that something you're looking to solve in the future? Yeah, turbidity is always an issue with ROVs. I mean, there's ways of getting around it with very expensive technology, like, you know, there's acoustic imaging and stuff like that. Um, we're actually, as we grow, um, we're starting to look into tackling problems that are bigger and more complex like that. Like, can we build an acoustic imaging system, or a side scanning sonar system, or, or an acoustic positioning system? for very, very little cost. We've been able to do it with ROVs and with enough geeky people in our community, it seems plausible. Um, other than that, though, um, there's already some stuff you can do with computer vision. For instance, if you can only see you know, 20 centimeters in front of you and you're trying to get a, a you know, bathymetric image, for instance, um, you could just fly you know, really, really close to the ground and take smaller areas at a time. But if you have really good overlaying capability, you could presumably stitch those together and get kind of a map. Um, but there's definitely a lot of research that needs to be done there. Uh, yeah, next question. Yeah, so you just work for yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, so I was um, working at NASA Ames, um, and then I kind of, I started going to grad school at Santa Clara, um, and then as Open RME started taking off, both of those kind of started to fizzle. Um, I'm still technically at Santa Clara. I'd like to finish my degree, but right now Open RME is more than a full-time job. David and I both are working that 
full time, um, like seven days a week, probably 15 to 16 hours a day. Um, and we're growing. We're now at about four and a half full time equivalents. This summer will be up to 10. Um, it's awesome. I mean, if I, if I never had to make money for a living, I think this is exactly what I'd do. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Um, what, have you made any conclusions about what is happening with the um, ecosystem in Antarctica when those ships go back and forth? Did you get any results from those? Or is that still under wraps? I would defer to <laughs> Stacey Kim, the expert on that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not under wraps. We're still working on it. We um, didn't go last year because of the government shutdown and the bad timing, but we're going back again this year. Um, our first year set of data had some problems with the acoustics. We um, had a cracked transducer phase, which meant that our data was not of the highest quality. So we're, we're hesitant to draw conclusions yet. Um, what it appears is that the, the system is much more driven by top predators than most, uh, most ecosystems, simply because there are so many top predators, because humans haven't killed them all. So um, we're, we haven't drawn any conclusions or any publications yet, but that's how preliminary. It's, it's really cool to be part of discovering something that's completely unknown like that. Uh, any other questions? Is the open source software uh, working out really well for you? It's, it's starting to get a lot better. Um, this question was about open source. I don't know if I mentioned it very clearly before, but like I mentioned, everything we design, both our software, our hardware, our CAD files, our build of materials, is all something that we put on the internet for free. Um, we want it to be available to as many people as possible. Um, open source software is always a bit tricky because, you know, well, any type of design that's open source where, you know, you kind of say this is it as is and we're hoping the community can fix it. The community tends to fix the things that are most interesting and doesn't fix or document the things that are boring. So you end up with this big disparity. The way we're trying to correct for that is by hiring people to do the things that are not as interesting. Um, but, but at this point, we've got fairly reliable software. The RV, you know, you can fly it around, you can navigate into a ship, um, but there's still a lot more that can happen. But there's a question in the back. Yeah, um, you guys are dropping a um, <coughs> skiing fatty into the ice. Um, he mentioned it was almost like a new rope motion. Um, I, mean, I know you, you worked at NASA, um, and I know there's, there's really just kind of that, that talk like about moons, and, and, and I guess with the, the way the budget is, maybe they're not talking about it. But I mean, while well, at your time at NASA and, and in Antarctica, I mean, has, has there kind of been any talk of, of like using, um, I guess, extreme environments like Antarctica to, to sort of test? Uh, yeah. In this, in this uh, specific, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That, that mission, the Wizard mission, I think, had a lot to do with Europa. Um, I mean, the, there's, I mean, you might be able to comment better than I can on it, but it, as far as I understood, a lot of it was specifically like, if we were going to go to Europa, what would we need to learn about under ice sampling? We have a NASA Roses grant to um, build an autonomous underwater vehicle. It's actually going to be a hybrid. It'll have a, a single fiber optic tether to it that, you know, will work until it breaks. <laughs> to control the vehicle. Um, the idea behind the vehicle is that it is the first prototype for something that will be flown to Enceladus or Europa or one of the other um, extraplanetary bodies that has liquid on it. So there's a parallel grant that's being done by the same aerospace engineering company um, to develop a way to get through the ice on uh, an extraterrestrial body. Um, so there's a lot of development going on, but Antarctica is a really good test bed for those kinds of things. Plus it gives us a chance to look under these, under this permanent ice that's hundreds of meters thick, which is a place we've never gotten to see before. So, from an ecological perspective, it's really cool. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any other questions for Eric, uh, please be around for a little yeah. bit. Um, so, you know, thanks again. Eric. Thank you guys very much.